This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Night and Day by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 27. London, in the first days of spring, has buds that open and flowers that suddenly shake their petals, white, purple, or crimson, in competition with the display in the garden beds, although these city flowers are merely so many doors flung wide in Bond Street and the neighborhood, inviting you to look at a picture, or hear a symphony, or merely crowd and crush yourself among all sorts of vocal, excitable, brightly colored human beings. But all the same, it is no mean rival to the quieter process of vegetable fluorescence. Whether or not there is a generous motive at the root, a desire to share and impart, or whether the animation is purely that of insensate fervor and friction, the effect, while it lasts, certainly encourages those who are young, and those who are ignorant, to think the world one great bazaar, with banners fluttering and divans heaped with spoils from every quarter of the globe for their delight. As Cassandra Otway went about London, provided with shillings that opened turnstiles, or more often with large white cards that disregarded turnstiles, the city seemed to her the most lavish and hospitable of hosts. After visiting the National Gallery, or Hertford House, or hearing Brahms or Beethoven at the Beckstein Hall, she would come back to find a new person awaiting her, in whose soul were embedded some grains of the invaluable substance which she still called reality, and still believed that she could find. The Hillberries, as the saying is, knew every one, and that arrogant claim was certainly upheld by the number of houses which, within a certain area, lit their lamps at night, opened their doors after three p.m., and admitted the Hillburys to their dining-rooms, say, once a month. An indefinable freedom and authority of manner, shared by most of the people who lived in these houses, seemed to indicate that whether it was a question of art, music, or government, they were well within the gates, and could smile indulgently at the vast mass of humanity which is forced to wait and struggle, and pay for entrance with common coin at the door. The gates opened instantly to admit Cassandra. She was naturally critical of what went on inside, and inclined to quote what Henry would have said. But she often succeeded in contradicting Henry, in his absence, and invariably paid her partner at dinner, or the kind old lady who remembered her grandmother, the compliment of believing that there was meaning in what they said. For the sake of the light in her eager eyes, much crudity of expression and some untidiness of person were forgiven her. It was generally felt that, given a year or two of experience, introduced to good dressmakers, and preserved from bad influences, she would be an acquisition. These elderly ladies, who sit on the edge of ballrooms sampling the stuff of humanity between finger and thumb, and breathing so evenly that the necklaces which rise and fall upon their breasts seem to represent some elemental force, such as the waves upon the ocean of humanity, concluded, a little smilingly, that she would do. They meant that she would in all probability marry some young man whose mother they respected. William Rodney was fertile in suggestions. He knew of little galleries and select concerts and private performances, and somehow made time to meet Catherine and Cassandra and to give them tea or dinner or supper in his rooms afterwards. Each one of her fourteen days thus promised to bear some bright illumination in its sober text. But Sunday approached. The day is usually dedicated to nature. The weather was almost kindly enough for an expedition, but Cassandra rejected Hampton Court, Greenwich, Richmond, and Kew in favor of the zoological gardens. She had once trifled with the psychology of animals, and still knew something about inherited characteristics. On Sunday afternoon, therefore, Catherine, Cassandra, and William Rodney drove off to the zoo. As their cab approached the entrance, Catherine bent forward and waved her hand to a young man who was walking rapidly in the same direction. "'There's Ralph Denham!' she exclaimed. "'I told him to meet us here,' she added. She had even come provided with a ticket for him. William's objection that he would not be admitted was, therefore, silenced directly but the way in which the two men greeted each other was significant of what was going to happen. As soon as they had admired the little birds in the large cage, William and Cassandra lagged behind, and Ralph and Catherine pressed on rather in advance. It was an arrangement in which William took his part, and one that suited his convenience, but he was annoyed all the same. He thought that Catherine should have told him that she had invited Denham to meet them. 
"'One of Catherine's friends,' he said rather sharply. It was clear that he was irritated, and Cassandra felt for his annoyance. They were standing by the pen of some oriental hog, and she was prodding the brute gently with the point of her umbrella, when a thousand little observations seemed, in some way, to collect in one centre. The centre was one of intense and curious emotion. Were they happy? She dismissed the question as she asked it, scorning herself for applying such simple measures to the rare and splendid emotions of so unique a couple. Nevertheless, her manner became immediately different, as if for the first time she felt consciously womanly, and as if William might conceivably wish later on to confide in her. She forgot all about the psychology of animals, and the recurrence of blue eyes and brown, and became instantly engrossed in her feelings as a woman who could administer consolation, and she hoped that Catherine would keep ahead with Mr. Denham, as a child who plays at being grown up hopes that her mother won't come in just yet and spoil the game. Or was it not rather that she had ceased to play at being grown up, and was conscious suddenly that she was alarmingly mature and in earnest? There was still unbroken silence between Catherine and Ralph Denham, but the occupants of the different cages served instead of speech. "'What have you been doing since we met?' Ralph asked at length. "'Doing?' she pondered. "'Walking in and out of other people's houses. I wonder if these animals are happy,' she speculated, stopping before a grey bear who was philosophically playing with a tassel which once, perhaps, formed part of a lady's parasol. "'I'm afraid Rodney didn't like my coming,' Ralph remarked. "'No, but he'll soon get over that,' she replied. The detachment expressed by her voice puzzled Ralph, and he would have been glad if she had explained her meaning further. But he was not going to press her for explanations. Each moment was to be, as far as he could make it, complete in itself, owing nothing of its happiness to explanations, barring neither bright nor dark tints from the future. "'The bears seem happy,' he remarked. "'But we must buy them a bag of something. There's the place to buy buns. Let's go and get them.' They walked to the counter piled with little paper bags, and each simultaneously produced a shilling and pressed it upon the young lady, who did not know whether to oblige the lady or the gentleman but decided, from conventional reasons, that it was the part of the gentleman to pay. "'I wish to pay,' said Ralph peremptorily, refusing the coin which Catherine tendered. "'I have a reason for what I do,' he added, seeing her smile at his tone of decision. "'I believe you have a reason for everything,' she agreed, breaking the bun into parts and tossing them down the bear's throats. "'But I can't believe it's a good one, this time. What's your reason?' He refused to tell her. He could not explain to her that he was offering up consciously all his happiness to her, and wished, absurdly enough, to pour every possession he had upon the blazing pyre, even his silver and gold. He wished to keep this distance between them, the distance which separates the devotee from the image in the shrine. Circumstances conspired to make this easier than it would have been had they been seated in a drawing-room, for example, with a tea-tray between them. He saw her against the background of pale grottoes and sleek hides. Camels slanted their heavy-lidded eyes at her, giraffes fastidiously observed her from their melancholy eminence, and the pink-lined trunks of elephants cautiously abstracted buns from her outstretched hands. Then there were the hothouses. He saw her bending over pythons coiled upon the sand, or considering the brown rock breaking the stagnant water of the alligator's pool, or searching some minute section of tropical forest for the golden eye of a lizard or the indrawn movement of the green frog's flanks. In particular he saw her outlined against the deep green waters, in which squadrons of silvery fish wheeled incessantly, or ogled her for a moment, pressing their distorted mouths against the glass, quivering their tails straight out behind them. Again there was the insect house, where she lifted the blinds of the little cages, and marvelled at the purple circles marked upon the rich tussor wings of some lately emerged and semi-conscious butterfly, or at caterpillars immobile like the knobbed twigs of a pale-skinned tree, or at slim green snakes stabbing the glass wall again and again with their flickering cleft tongues. The heat of the air and the bloom of heavy flowers, which swam in water or rose stiffly from great red jars, together with the display of curious patterns and fantastic shapes, produced an atmosphere in which human beings tended to look pale and to fall silent. 
Opening the door of a house which rang with the mocking and profoundly unhappy laughter of monkeys, they discovered William and Cassandra. William appeared to be tempting some small reluctant animal to descend from an upper perch to partake of half an apple. Cassandra was reading out, in her high-pitched tones, an account of this creature's secluded disposition and nocturnal habits. She saw Catherine and exclaimed, "'Here you are! Do prevent William from torturing this unfortunate eye-eye!' "'We thought we'd lost you,' said William. He looked from one to the other, and seemed to take stock of Denham's unfashionable appearance. He seemed to wish to find some outlet for malevolence, but failing one he remained silent. The glance, the slight quiver of the upper lip, were not lost upon Catherine. "'William isn't kind to animals,' she remarked. "'He doesn't know what they like and what they don't like.' "'I take it you're well versed in these matters, Denham.' said Rodney, withdrawing his hand with the apple. "'It's mainly a question of knowing how to stroke them,' Denham replied. "'Which is the way to the reptile house?' Cassandra asked him, not from a genuine desire to visit the reptiles, but in obedience to her newborn feminine susceptibility, which urged her to charm and conciliate the other sex. Denham began to give her directions, and Catherine and William moved on together. "'I hope you've had a pleasant afternoon,' William remarked. I like Ralph Denham, she replied. Sans se voir, William returned with superficial urbanity. Many retorts were obvious, but wishing, on the whole, for peace, Catherine merely inquired, Are you coming back to tea? Cassandra and I thought of having tea at a little shop in Portland Place, he replied. I don't know whether you and Denham would care to join us. I'll ask him, she replied, turning her head to look for him but he and Cassandra were absorbed in the eye-eye once more. William and Catherine watched them for a moment, and each looked curiously at the object of the other's preference. But resting his eye upon Cassandra, to whose elegance the dressmakers had now done justice, William said sharply, "'If you come, I hope you won't do your best to make me ridiculous.' "'If that's what you're afraid of, I certainly shan't come,' Catherine replied." They were professedly looking into the enormous central cage of monkeys, and being thoroughly annoyed by William, she compared him to a wretched misanthropical ape, huddled in a scrap of old shawl at the end of a pole, darting peevish glances of suspicion and distrust at his companions. Her tolerance was deserting her. The events of the past week had worn it thin. She was in one of those moods, perhaps not uncommon with either sex, when the other becomes very clearly distinguished and of contemptible baseness, so that the necessity of association is degrading, and the tie, which at such moments is always extremely close, drags like a halter round the neck. William's exacting demands and his jealousy had pulled her down into some horrible swamp of her nature, where the primeval struggle between man and woman still rages. "'You seem to delight in hurting me,' William persisted. Why did you say that just now about my behavior to animals? As he spoke, he rattled his stick against the bars of the cage, which gave his words an accompaniment peculiarly exasperating to Catherine's nerves. Because it's true. You never see what any one feels, she said. You think of no one but yourself. That is not true, said William. By his determined rattling, he had now collected the animated attention of some half-dozen apes. Either to propitiate them, or to show his consideration for their feelings, he proceeded to offer them the apple which he held. The sight, unfortunately, was so comically apt in its illustration of the picture in her mind, the ruse was so transparent, that Catherine was seized with laughter. She laughed uncontrollably. William flushed red. No display of anger could have hurt his feelings more profoundly. It was not only that she was laughing at him, the detachment of the sound was horrible. "'I don't know what you're laughing at,' he muttered, and, turning, found that the other couple had rejoined them. As if the matter had been privately agreed upon, the couple separated once more, Catherine and Denham passing out of the house without more than a perfunctory glance round them. Denham obeyed what seemed to be Catherine's wish in thus making haste. Some change had come over her. He connected it with her laughter, and her few words in private with Rodney. He felt that she had become unfriendly to him. She talked, but her remarks were indifferent, and when he spoke her attention seemed to wander. This change of mood was at first extremely disagreeable to him, 
but soon he found it salutary. The pale, drizzling atmosphere of the day affected him also. The charm, the insidious magic in which he had luxuriated, were suddenly gone. His feeling had become one of friendly respect, and to his great pleasure he found himself thinking spontaneously of the relief of finding himself alone in his room that night. In his surprise at the suddenness of the change, and at the extent of his freedom, he bethought him of a daring plan, by which the ghost of Catherine could be more effectually exercised than by mere abstinence. He would ask her to come home with him to tea. He would force her through the mill of family life. He would place her in a light unsparing and revealing. His family would find nothing to admire in her, and she, he felt certain, would despise them all, and this, too, would help him. He felt himself becoming more and more merciless towards her. By such courageous measures any one, he thought, could end the absurd passions which were the cause of so much pain and waste. He could foresee a time when his experiences, his discovery, and his triumph were made available for younger brothers who found themselves in the same predicament. He looked at his watch, and remarked that the gardens would soon be closed. "'Anyhow,' he said, "'I think we've seen enough for one afternoon. Where have the others got to?' He looked over his shoulder, and seeing no trace of them, remarked at once, "'We'd better be independent of them. The best plan will be for you to come back to tea with me.' "'Why shouldn't you come with me?' she asked. "'Because we're next door to Highgate here,' he replied promptly. She assented, having very little notion whether Highgate was next door to Regent's Park or not. She was only glad to put off her return to the family tea-table in Chelsea for an hour or two. They proceeded with dogged determination through the winding roads of Regent's Park, and the Sunday-stricken streets of the neighborhood, in the direction of the tube-station. Ignorant of the way, she resigned herself entirely to him, and found his silence a convenient cover beneath which to continue her anger with Rodney. When they stepped out of the train into the still grayer gloom of Highgate, she wondered for the first time where he was taking her. Had he a family, or did he live alone in rooms? On the whole she was inclined to believe that he was the only son of an aged and possibly invalid mother. She sketched lightly, upon the blank vista down which they walked, the little white house and the tremulous old lady rising from behind her tea-table, to greet her with faltering words about, "'My son's friends,' and was on the point of asking Ralph to tell her what she might expect, when he jerked open one of the infinite number of identical wooden doors, and led her up a tiled path to a porch in the alpine style of architecture. As they listened to the shaking of the bell in the basement, she could summon no vision to replace the one so rudely destroyed. "'I must warn you to expect a family party,' said Ralph. "'They're mostly in on Sundays. We can go to my room afterwards.' "'Have you many brothers and sisters?' she asked, without concealing her dismay. Six or seven, he replied grimly, as the door opened. While Ralph took off his coat, she had time to notice the ferns and photographs and draperies, and to hear a hum, or rather a babble, of voices talking each other down from the sound of them. The rigidity of extreme shyness came over her. She kept as far behind Denham as she could, and walked stiffly after him into a room blazing with unshaded lights, which fell upon a number of people of different ages, sitting round a large dining-room table, untidily strewn with food, and unflinchingly lit up by incandescent gas. Ralph walked straight to the far end of the table. "'Mother, this is Miss Hilbury,' he said. A large elderly lady, bent over an unsatisfactory spirit-lamp, looked up with a little frown, and observed, "'I beg your pardon. I thought you were one of my own girls. Dorothy,' she continued on the same breath, to catch the servant before she left the room. We shall want some more methylated spirits, unless the lamp itself is out of order. If one of you could invent a good spirit lamp— She sighed, looking generally down the table, and then began seeking among the china before her for two clean cups for the newcomers. The unsparing light revealed more ugliness than Catherine had seen in one room for a very long time. It was the ugliness of enormous folds of brown material, looped and festooned, of plush curtains from which depended balls and fringes, partially concealing bookshelves swollen with black school texts. Her eye was arrested by cross scabbards of fretted wood upon the dull green wall, and wherever there was a high flat eminence, some fern waved from a pot of crinkled china, or a bronze horse reared so high that the stump of a tree had to sustain his forequarters. 
the waters of family life seemed to rise and close over her head, and she munched in silence. At length Mrs. Denham looked up from her teacups and remarked, "'You see, Miss Hilberry, my children all come in at different hours, and want different things. The tray should go up if you're done, Johnny. My boy, Charles, is in bed with a cold. What else can you expect, standing in the wet playing football? We did try drawing-room tea, but it didn't do.' A boy of sixteen, who appeared to be Johnny, grumbled derisively both at the notion of drawing-room tea and at the necessity of carrying a tray up to his brother. But he took himself off, being enjoined by his mother to mind what he was doing, and shut the door after him. "'It's much nicer like this,' said Catherine, applying herself with determination to the dissection of her cake. They had given her too large a slice. She knew that Mrs. Denham suspected her of critical comparisons. She knew that she was making poor progress with her cake. Mrs. Denham had looked at her sufficiently often to make it clear to Catherine that she was asking who this young woman was, and why Ralph had brought her to tea with them. There was an obvious reason, which Mrs. Denham had probably reached by this time. Outwardly she was behaving with rather rusty and laborious civility. She was making conversation about the amenities of Highgate, its development and situation. "'When I first married,' she said, "'Highgate was quite separate from London, Miss Hilbury. And this house, though you wouldn't believe it, had a view of apple orchards. That was before the Middletons built their house in front of us. "'It must be a great advantage to live at the top of a hill,' said Catherine. Mrs. Denham agreed effusively, as if her opinion of Catherine's sense had risen. "'Yes, indeed, we find it very healthy,' she said. And she went on, as people who live in the suburbs so often do, to prove that it was healthier, more convenient, and less spoilt than any suburb round London. She spoke with such emphasis that it was quite obvious that she expressed unpopular views, and that her children disagreed with her. "'The ceiling's fallen down in the pantry again,' said Hester, a girl of eighteen, abruptly. "'The whole house will be down one of these days,' James muttered. "'Nonsense,' said Mrs. Denham. "'It's only a little bit of plaster. I don't see how any house could be expected to stand the wear and tear you give it. Here some family joke exploded, which Catherine could not follow. Even Mrs. Denham laughed against her will. "'Miss Hilbury's thinking us all so rude,' she added reprovingly. Miss Hilbury smiled and shook her head, and was conscious that a great many eyes rested upon her for a moment, as if they would find pleasure in discussing her when she was gone. Owing perhaps to this critical glance, Catherine decided that Ralph Denham's family was commonplace, unshapely, lacking in charm, and fitly expressed by the hideous nature of their furniture and decorations. She glanced along a mantelpiece ranged with bronze chariots, silver vases, and china ornaments that were either facetious or eccentric. She did not apply her judgment consciously to Ralph, but when she looked at him a moment later she rated him lower than at any other time of their acquaintanceship. He had made no effort to tide over the discomforts of her introduction, and now, engaged in argument with his brother, apparently forgot her presence. She must have counted upon his support more than she realized, for this indifference, emphasized as it was by the insignificant commonplace of his surroundings, awoke her not only to that ugliness, but to her own folly. She thought of one scene after another in a few seconds, with that shudder which is almost a blush. She had believed him when he spoke of friendship. She had believed in a spiritual light burning steadily and steadfastly behind the erratic disorder and incoherence of life. The light was now gone out, suddenly, as if a sponge had blotted it. The litter of the table and the tedious but exacting conversation of Mrs. Denham remained. They struck, indeed, upon a mind bereft of all defences, and keenly conscious of the degradation which is the result of strife whether victorious or not. She thought gloomily of her loneliness, of life's futility, of the barren prose of reality, of William Rodney, of her mother, and the unfinished book. Her answers to Mrs. Denham were perfunctory to the verge of rudeness, and to Ralph, who watched her narrowly, she seemed further away than was compatible with her physical closeness. He glanced at her, and ground out further steps in his argument, determined that no folly should remain when this experience was over. Next moment a silence, sudden and complete, descended upon them all. The silence of all these people round the untidy table was enormous and hideous. Something horrible seemed about to burst from it, but they endured it obstinately. 
A second later the door opened, and there was a stir of relief, cries of, "'Hello, Joan! There's nothing left for you to eat!' broke up the oppressive concentration of so many eyes upon the tablecloth, and set the waters of family life dashing in brisk little waves again. It was obvious that Joan had some mysterious and beneficent power upon her family. She went up to Catherine as if she had heard of her, and was very glad to see her at last. She explained that she had been visiting an uncle who was ill, and that had kept her. No, she hadn't had any tea, but a slice of bread would do. Someone handed up a hot cake, which had been keeping warm in the fender. She sat down by her mother's side. Mrs. Denham's anxiety seemed to relax, and everyone began eating and drinking, as if the tea had begun over again. Hester voluntarily explained to Catherine that she was reading to pass some examination, because she wanted more than anything in the world to go to Newnham. "'Now just let me hear you decline M.O. I love.' Johnny demanded. "'No, Johnny, no Greek at mealtimes,' said Joan, overhearing him instantly. "'She's up at all hours of the night over her books, Miss Hilbury, and I'm sure that's not the way to pass examinations,' she went on, smiling at Catherine, with the worried humorous smile of the elder sister, whose younger brothers and sisters have become almost like children of her own. "'Joan, you don't really think that M.O. is Greek?' Ralph asked. Did I say Greek? Well, never mind. No dead languages at tea-time. My dear boy, don't trouble to make me any toast. Or if you do, surely there's a toasting-fork somewhere, said Mrs. Denham, still cherishing the belief that the bread-knife could be spoiled. Do one of you ring and ask for one, she said, without any conviction that she would be obeyed. But is Anne coming to be with Uncle Joseph? she continued. If so, surely they had better send Amy to us and in the mysterious delight of learning further details of these arrangements, and suggesting more sensible plans of her own, which, from the aggrieved way in which she spoke, she did not seem to expect any one to adopt, Mrs. Denham completely forgot the presence of a well-dressed visitor, who had to be informed about the amenities of Highgate. As soon as Joan had taken her seat, an argument had sprung up on either side of Catherine, as to whether the Salvation Army has any right to play hymns at street corners on Sunday mornings, thereby making it impossible for James to have his sleep out, and tampering with the rights of individual liberty. "'You see, James likes to lie in bed and sleep like a hog,' said Johnny, explaining himself to Catherine, whereupon James fired up, and, making her his goal, also exclaimed, "'Because Sundays are my one chance in the week of having my sleep out. Johnny messes with stinking chemicals in the pantry.' They appealed to her, and she forgot her cake, and began to laugh and talk and argue with sudden animation. The large family seemed to her so warm and various that she forgot to censure them for their taste in pottery. But the personal question between James and Johnny merged into some argument already apparently debated, so that the parts had been distributed among the family, in which Ralph took the lead, and Catherine found herself opposed to him, and the champion of Johnny's cause, who it appeared always lost his head and got excited in argument with Ralph. "'Yes, yes, that's what I mean. She's got it right!' he exclaimed, after Catherine had restated his case and made it more precise. The debate was left almost solely to Catherine and Ralph. They looked into each other's eyes fixedly, like wrestlers trying to see what movement is coming next. And while Ralph spoke, Catherine bit her lower lip, and was always ready with her next point as soon as he had done. They were very well matched, and held the opposite views. But at the most exciting stage of the argument, for no reason that Catherine could see, all chairs were pushed back, and one after another the Denham family got up and went out of the door, as if a bell had summoned them. She was not used to the clockwork regulations of a large family. She hesitated in what she was saying, and rose. Mrs. Denham and Joan had drawn together, and stood by the fireplace, slightly raising their skirts above their ankles, and discussing something which had an air of being very serious and very private. They appeared to have forgotten her presence among them. Ralph stood holding the door open for her. "'Won't you come up to my room?' he said, and Catherine, glancing back at Joan, who smiled at her in a preoccupied way, followed Ralph upstairs. She was thinking of their argument, and when, after the long climb, he opened his door, she began at once. The question is, then, at what point is it right for the individual to assert his will against the will of the State? For some time they continued the argument, and then the intervals between one statement and the next became longer and longer, and they spoke more speculatively 
and less pugnaciously, and at last fell silent. Catherine went over the argument in her mind, remembering how, now and then, it had been set conspicuously on the right course by some remark offered either by James or by Johnny. "'Your brothers are very clever,' she said. "'I suppose you're in the habit of arguing?' "'James and Johnny will go on like that for hours,' Ralph replied. "'So will Hester, if you start her upon Elizabethan dramatists.' "'And the little girl with the pigtail?' "'Molly? She's only ten. But they're always arguing among themselves.' He was immensely pleased by Catherine's praise of his brothers and sisters. He would have liked to go on telling her about them, but he checked himself. "'I see that it must be difficult to leave them,' Catherine continued. His deep pride in his family was more evident to him at that moment than ever before, and the idea of living alone in a cottage was ridiculous. All that brotherhood and sisterhood, and a common childhood and a common past mean, all the stability, the unambitious comradeship, and tacit understanding of family life at its best, came to his mind, and he thought of them as a company, of which he was the leader, bound on a difficult, dreary, but glorious voyage. And it was Catherine who had opened his eyes to this, he thought. A little dry chirp from the corner of the room now roused her attention. "'My tame rook,' he explained briefly. A cat had bitten off one of its legs. She looked at the rook, and her eyes went from one object to another. "'You sit here and read?' she said, her eyes resting upon his books. He said that he was in the habit of working here at night. "'The great advantage of Highgate is the view over London. At night the view from my window is splendid.' He was extremely anxious that she should appreciate his view, and she rose to see what was to be seen. It was already dark enough for the turbulent haze to be yellow with the light of street lamps, and she tried to determine the quarters of the city beneath her. The sight of her gazing from his window gave him a peculiar satisfaction. When she turned at length, he was still sitting motionless in his chair. "'It must be late,' she said. "'I must be going.' She settled upon the arm of the chair irresolutely, thinking that she had no wish to go home. William would be there, and he would find some way of making things unpleasant for her, and the memory of their quarrel came back to her. She had noticed Ralph's coldness, too. She looked at him, and from his fixed stare she thought that he must be working out some theory, some argument. He had thought, perhaps, of some fresh point in his position, as to the bounds of personal liberty. She waited, silently, thinking about liberty. "'You've won again,' he said at last, without moving. "'I've won?' she repeated, thinking of the argument. "'I wish to God I hadn't asked you here,' he burst out. "'What do you mean?' "'When you're here, it's different. I'm happy.' You've only to walk to the window. You've only to talk about liberty. When I saw you down there among them all, he stopped short. You thought how ordinary I was. I tried to think so. But I thought you were more wonderful than ever. An immense relief, and a reluctance to enjoy that relief, conflicted in her heart. She slid down into the chair. I thought you disliked me, she said. God knows I tried, he replied. I've done my best to see you as you are, without any of this damned romantic nonsense. That was why I asked you here, and it's increased my folly. When you're gone, I shall look out of that window and think of you. I shall waste the whole evening thinking of you. I shall waste my whole life, I believe. He spoke with such vehemence that her relief disappeared. She frowned, and her tone changed to one almost of severity. This is what I foretold. We shall gain nothing but unhappiness. Look at me, Ralph. He looked at her. I assure you that I'm far more ordinary than I appear. Beauty means nothing whatever. In fact, the most beautiful women are generally the most stupid. I'm not that, but I'm a matter-of-fact, prosaic, rather ordinary character. I order the dinner, I pay the bills, I do the accounts, I wind up the clock, and I never look at a book. You forget, he began, but she would not let him speak. You come and see me among flowers and pictures, and think me mysterious, romantic, and all the rest of it. Being yourself very inexperienced and very emotional, you go home and invent a story about me, and now you can't separate me from the person you've imagined me to be. You call that, I suppose, being in love. As a matter of fact, it's being in delusion. All romantic people are the same, she added. My mother spends her life in making stories about the people she's fond of, 
"'But I won't have you do it about me, if I can help it.' "'You can't help it,' he said. "'I warn you, it's the source of all evil. "'And of all good,' he added. "'You'll find out that I'm not what you think me. "'Perhaps. "'But I shall gain more than I lose. "'If such gain's worth having.' "'They were silent for a space. "'That may be what we have to face,' he said. "'There may be nothing else, nothing but what we imagine.' THE REASON OF OUR LONELINESS, SHE MUSED, AND THEY WERE SILENT FOR A TIME. WHEN ARE YOU TO BE MARRIED? HE ASKED ABRUPTLY, WITH A CHANGE OF TONE. NOT TILL SEPTEMBER, I THINK. IT'S BEEN PUT OFF. YOU WON'T BE LONELY THEN, HE SAID. ACCORDING TO WHAT PEOPLE SAY, MARRIAGE IS A VERY QUEER BUSINESS. THEY SAY IT'S DIFFERENT FROM ANYTHING ELSE. IT MAY BE TRUE. I'VE KNOWN ONE OR TWO CASES WHERE IT SEEMS TO BE TRUE. He hoped that she would go on with the subject, but she made no reply. He had done his best to master himself, and his voice was sufficiently indifferent, but her silence tormented him. She would never speak to him of Rodney of her own accord, and her reserve left a whole continent of her soul in darkness. "'It may be put off even longer than that,' she said, as if by an afterthought. "'Someone in the office is ill, and William has to take his place.' "'We may put it off for some time, in fact.' "'That's rather hard on him, isn't it?' Ralph asked. "'He has his work,' she replied. "'He has lots of things that interest him. "'I know I've been to that place.' She broke off, pointing to a photograph. "'But I can't remember where it is. "'Oh, of course, it's Oxford. "'Now what about your cottage?' "'I'm not going to take it.' "'How you change your mind,' she smiled. "'It's not that,' he said impatiently. It's that I want to be where I can see you. Our compact is going to hold in spite of all I've said? she asked. Forever, as far as I'm concerned, he replied. You're going to go on dreaming and imagining and making up stories about me as you walk along the street, and pretending that we're riding in a forest or landing on an island? No, I shall think of you ordering dinner, paying bills, doing the accounts, showing old ladies the relics. That's better, she said. You can think of me tomorrow morning, looking up dates in the Dictionary of National Biography. And forgetting your purse, Ralph added. At this she smiled, but in another moment her smile faded, either because of his words or of the way in which he spoke them. She was capable of forgetting things. He saw that. But what more did he see? Was he not looking at something she had never shown to anybody? Was it not something so profound that the notion of his seeing it almost shocked her? Her smile faded, and for a moment she seemed upon the point of speaking. But looking at him in silence, with a look that seemed to ask what she could not put into words, she turned and bade him good night. End of chapter 27